Well, it'd be so helpful to have your Bibles, Bible apps still open, so particularly at Luke chapter 4 today as we continue in our Advent series. Actually, the second last week in our Advent series, it's the penultimate week, which is always fun to say, but as we come and approach Christmas, we do so anticipating and looking forward to the return of Jesus. That's the focus of, of Advent. And so today, as we look at this section in Luke, there are some sermon points on the back of the news. There are in English, Korean, Dinka, and Simplified Chinese, so please make use of those if that's of help to you. Right now, let's pray and ask for God's help. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for the good news. The good news that you have sent your son to us just as you have promised in order that we can be saved. Lord, how we praise you. Please help us plumb the depths of that good news this day. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the central parts, or I think one of the most important parts of the parenting gig is to help your children understand the weightiness of promises. So, you know, you may have had a conversation that goes something like this. Did you spill paint all over the carpet in the bedroom? <laughs> no, definitely wasn't me. Okay, do you promise that you didn't spill paint all over the carpet? Well, I promise I didn't mean to. Now, of course, at one level, we want all of our words to be true, don't we? We don't want some sort of grading of our integrity of our words from honesty to, to fuzzy. We don't want a distinction between promises and everything else. But there is also a weightiness to making a promise that not only speaks to truthfulness, but also a commitment to follow through with the original intention. Promises are, are true words that aren't to bind us in some way. Now, we make all sorts of promises, both big and small, but if we're honest, we don't always deliver on them. And I reckon it's usually because of one of, or a combination of, four main reasons. We have insufficient power, so we just make a promise that we don't really have the capability to keep. We have inadequate will. We forget we never were really committed or our commitment wanes. We make mistakes. Our sin gets in the way of keeping what we have sometimes promised. And we are mortal. Our human limits sometimes prevent us from making good on the commitments that we have made. Making a promise is often easier than keeping it. And part of the story of the Bible is that humans are often great promise makers, but not so great, perhaps even a little sketchy, promise keepers. Yet that is not the case with God. In fact, I want to suggest that it's not just a claim, but the Bible provides the evidence. God delivers on his promises. For he is all-powerful, he's omnipotent. There is nothing beyond his capability. For he is all-knowing, omniscient, he knows and does not forget anything. For he is incorruptible, he is completely without sin. For he is eternal. He has no limits, including no beginning and no end. God is both willing and able. And the reason why we need to really know that is, is not only because we need to have a confidence that God, unlike us, is the perfect promise keeper, but we also need to know that because the nature of the promises that, that God invites us into are staggering. Now, there's a whole raft of promises by God to us and others and the world throughout the Bible. There are far too many promises for us to sort of work through one by one today. You might be relieved by that. Uh, you'll read sometimes that those promises are actually expressed more formally, so they're expressed as, as specific covenants. We've in the past even done a series on the promises of God that you count on. So our approach today could be, well, let's just try and find the biggest promise, or the most significant promise, or the best promise, or something like that. There could be a few contenders. But I want to suggest today that our approach would be to, to take a bit of a step back and to recognise that one way or another, all of God's promises find their origin 
right in the beginning chapters of the Bible, and they find there are men in Jesus. Okay? That, that God would pave a way for us to be his people and he our God. That he would rescue us and renew his creation. That sin would be dealt with. That justice would be done. That evil would be eradicated. That death would be overturned. That we would dwell with him. That creation would be made new. God has promised to send the one who will crush the serpent's head under his heel. So I reckon this is about as big as a claim you can, you can get. This is a comprehensive promise for salvation through Jesus, the God who came as promised. So let's break that down. As we consider that, let's look at how God will fulfill the promise, who this promise is for, and what this promise achieves, or a bit more simply, God's ultimate promise is fulfilled through Jesus to the poor for salvation. So first, God's ultimate promise is fulfilled through Jesus. Luke chapter 4, starting at verse 16. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. So Jesus has just returned from the time of testing in the wilderness. He's been travelling about, teaching, he's gaining notoriety. People are generally really impressed. But then in his hometown, as Jesus goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his practice, something absolutely extraordinary happens as he reads from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. So remember, this is 2,000 years ago. There aren't neat little bound up books that you can pick up. The scriptures, so the Bible in effect, were a collection of scrolls. And as someone retrieves that scroll and passes it to Jesus, he unrolls it looking for and searching for one spot which turns out to be one of the most, if not the most important, sections of Isaiah. Luke's synopsis here is actually Isaiah chapter 61, and it borrows a little bit from chapter 58. Uh, Jesus may have read even more than this, but the point is, this is the part of Isaiah that has just followed the promise of a suffering servant. This is the part of Isaiah that promises a, a messianic servant. So the Christ, it's the same word, a saviour appointed by God, to work on behalf of his people, to deal with sin, who will destroy God's enemies, who will bring justice, who will establish God's rule, who will assemble God's people and usher in new creation. And Jesus says, I am here. In effect, here I am. I've arrived. God's spirit is on me. The Lord is has anointed me. God has sent me. When Jesus says that, reads that, and then he sits, this is not some sort of dramatic mic drop moment, you know, just read it out, sit down, boom. It was the practice of the people to stand to read and then sit to teach. In fact, actually, everyone else would have remained standing while the teacher taught, I'm not suggesting that we implement that practice here, okay? But that's what they would have have done. And I want you to note that the very first thing that Jesus says when he sits down, having read that section of Isaiah, sitting down to teach, verse 21, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Don't miss how extraordinary this is. The people didn't understand what Jesus was saying at first, Here they are under the oppression of the Romans in a a backwater town. I mean, for a long time, historians or archaeologists thought 
Nazareth must not even exist because they'd found no evidence of it until later on. But they think that this is good news for them. Perhaps finally the Romans will be given the boot. Previously they had praised Jesus. Now at first they're chuffed, then perhaps a little baffled, isn't this Joseph's son? And then after Jesus keeps teaching, they're furious. Verse 28, they want to throw him off the edge of a cliff. They go from loving him to wanting to lynch him. And so even at the most superficial surface level, it means that whatever you might suppose about Jesus, don't make the mistake of suggesting that he considered himself just a teacher or a healer. That was just innocuous. Because he didn't. His claim couldn't be clearer. To make the sort of claim Jesus makes is either the work of an egocentric madman or this is the promised one, the greatest figure in the history of the world on whom our hope rests. Not a mere teacher, not a mere healer, not even a mere prophet, or one amongst many, but Jesus' claim is that he is the promised one on whom the hope of God's people, actually the hope of the entire world, rests. Jesus is saying, today, this scripture is fulfilled in me. Now, I reckon that's both refreshing and confronting. It's refreshing. It's really refreshing because it means that the way to God is clear. It's so clear. It means that if you want to begin to know how you can engage with God's promises, you don't need to go searching around, embarking upon some sort of spiritual journey. You don't need to to look within or try to rack up merit points. You just need to look to Jesus. But that's also confronting. It's confronting in at least two ways. It's confronting because, as we'll see in a moment, we are needy. We desperately need God. For God to send a saviour who will even die and rise for us, well, that presupposes that we need a saviour. Now, that offends all my sensibilities or many of my sensibilities in all sorts of ways because I often think, well, I'm okay, I'm good enough. I can actually do it on my own. But I can't. But it's also confronting because it means that Jesus is the only way. He's the one. As Tom Wright so simply puts it, it isn't just that God is doing something in general, but something through Jesus in particular. He is the way. It's refreshing and confronting. His claim is as exclusive as it is beautifully inclusive. It includes everyone, but only if you come through him. The readers of Luke, which includes us, well, in a way, are already in on that good news of who Jesus is. So if you read from the beginning of Luke, we've witnessed the Spirit of God descending on Jesus at his baptism. We heard the word, affirming words, the Father, this is his Son. We see later that the way that Jesus saves is by giving up his life for us on the cross. But the point is clear, that the way that God makes good on his promise finds its focus and fulfilment through, is through the one who is anointed, who he has sent. God's ultimate promise is fulfilled through Jesus. Uh, Second, uh, God's ultimate promise is to the needy or to the poor. So verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. The poor, the prisoner, the blind and the oppressed. There's been stacks of debate over the centuries about how best to understand this section. If the recipients of this proclamation are literally the poor, captive, blind and oppressed, and and there's absolutely no doubt, without a doubt, that the scriptures, the the Bible, witnesses deep concern for for the marginalised and that Jesus' followers should really share that concern for the least, the lost, 
the lonely and the last. That's, that's without a doubt. And we see that all throughout Luke as well. But we also see that the physical healing of the blind, the cleansing of the lepers and the raising of the dead, they were they're signals and signposts that God's kingdom has arrived in Jesus. But there's nothing else. In the uh, original context, remember this is from Isaiah, the poor and the needy weren't just those who were materially poor, but spiritually poor. So remember who Isaiah was speaking to. He was speaking to God's people, Israel, in Babylon. Why were they there? They were there because they were suffering under the judgment for the rebellion against God. Yet God is promising them through Isaiah that there will be a day of restoration. That's why they're all chuffed at first, it seems, by Jesus' gracious words. Finally, that day has arrived. Finally, we, God's chosen people, will be vindicated and released from being under the thumb of the Romans. But don't you know, the mood changes pretty quickly with some of what Jesus says next that prophets are not accepted in their hometown, that he is taking salvation beyond the bounds of Israel. Verse 25. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. So hear what Jesus is saying. He's not just saying that he has come only for the materially poor. That can't be the case. Uh, Zerath was poor, but Naaman was rich. The common element was that they were outsiders. But they're not only outsiders. They knew that they were. And so Jesus is saying, I've come not only for the poor, but those who know that they are. Of course, all the people gathered, they're absolutely infuriated at the synagogue. They are longing for when God will set things right. But there's no hometown advantage. And they've failed to understand that they're also in desperate need spiritually. I think it's no coincidence that the very first thing that Jesus does after this encounter is to go and cast out a demon. He goes and evicts evil. So Jesus hasn't just been sent to rescue a few from material poverty, physical ailments or worldly oppressors, but he is the one who's been sent to free everyone from the captivity of sin and death. Without Jesus, we're not just spiritually poor, we're spiritually bankrupt. I think, if we're honest, actually we can be probably a bit like those gathered in the synagogue that day. We can at times think, well, actually, we're pretty good. We're doing pretty well. In our culture, we can often bind and think, well, I'm free, I'm enlightened, I'm master of my own destiny. I've got it sorted. We're all right. But that's not how Jesus sees us. We're all beggars at the banquet. When Jesus sees us filled with compassion and love, he sees us apart from him as poor, captive to sin and death, in need of rescuing, in need of him. That's the good news Jesus has come. And it's only when we see clearly who Jesus is and who we are that we're ready to receive or keep on delighting in the gift of salvation. Uh, That's what God's ultimate promise is for, for salvation. Not just salvation of the individual who puts their trust in, in him, but of course it does include that, but also nothing less than the recreation of the entirety of all things. We're going to spend a whole week next week on when Jesus comes in in glory. But for now, let's look at verse 19. So Jesus came, verse 19, why? To proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. 
when Jesus quotes from Isaiah here, saying the year of the Lord's favour, this is a reference then to a future time when salvation would be proclaimed. It was the messianic age. By quoting this and saying it's been fulfilled, he is saying the day of salvation has arrived. And so this is an allusion to the practice of the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee was once every 50 years, or was meant to be once every 50 years, when everything was put right. It was a bit of a, a reset. It was a clean start. Slaves were freed. Debts were cancelled. Ancestral property was returned to the original family. And Isaiah originally predicted a time when God's people would be liberated from Babylonian exile. But Jesus is proclaiming an even greater liberation from sin and all of its consequences. Jesus says, as they look at him, they are seeing the very one in whom it will be fulfilled. The one who will rescue us, the one who is the redeemer. They have no idea of the path that will take Jesus on. But the day of salvation has arrived in him. It's really interesting, actually it's a bit peculiar, that as Jesus quotes from Isaiah 61, you may have noticed he, he actually cuts the, the quote from Isaiah 61 really abruptly short, just cuts it off mid-sentence. So let me read for you from, from Isaiah 61 and see if you pick up where he cuts short. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God. So do you know where Jesus cut short? The day of vengeance. In the original language, it's one sentence and he just cuts it short right in the middle. There's no punctuation there. He just cuts it off there. Why does he do that? It's not because Jesus didn't believe in judgment, okay? Because all throughout the Gospels, you can read many places where Jesus speaks about judgment and the day of judgment. He cuts it short there because that day has not yet arrived. That day will come. Jesus promised us that. But now is the time of the Lord's favour. This is the time when Jesus will take the judgment on himself. This is the time when salvation is proclaimed. This is the time when salvation can be received as a gift. God's ultimate promise of salvation is fulfilled through Jesus and offered to us by his grace. That is, as a gift. That has at least two big implications. Okay. If you know the gift of salvation, if you have put your trust in Jesus, well, we have the responsibility to share it. So even with the ones whom we think don't deserve it. Some of God's people did not think anyone else deserved God's rescuing. And so if you ever catch yourself thinking... Someone else doesn't deserve God's grace, or you catch yourself thinking that you deserve it just a little bit, just a little smidge a bit more than someone else, well, that's a clue that there's still plenty of room to keep plumbing the depths of what grace really is. None of us deserve God's grace. And when we grasp the reality of that clearly, then that will mean out of the outflowing of God's grace, undeservedly we have received, that should drive us to use our whole lives of pouring grace out to others. It should shape the content of our prayer, direct the heart of our action, and the deployment of our resources. This is salvation, as promised, through Jesus, available to all, and open for us to share. That's the first big implication. The second big implication of, of God's ultimate promise of salvation fulfilled through Jesus, offered to us by grace, is that if you have not yet received that gift of salvation, you can. Now, as we await Jesus' return, it is the time of the Lord's favour. It's a gift. Uh, we're just a, a week away from, from Christmas, in case you weren't aware, a bit of a heads up, just a week to Christmas. 
And, you know, you are probably about to give and receive a whole swag of gifts, I'm sure. And so I want you to imagine on, on Christmas Day how inappropriate it would be that one of your loved ones hands you a, a beautiful gift, uh, you unwrap it, you open it up, and then as soon as you see it, you whip out your phone, you say, thank you so much, let me transfer some money to you for that gift. Now, that would be completely inappropriate. But you don't pay for a gift. But here's the thing. It's not just that the idea of paying for God's gift of grace is poor etiquette, but none of us can. There's nothing we've got, there's nothing we'll gain, and there's nothing we can do. But actually be like whipping out your phone, going to make a payment, and seeing a balance of zero that we are powerless to change. There's not a smidge of a payment that we can provide. But there is one who has paid the cost. There is one, in fact, only one, who can offer us that gift. It is the gift of salvation. That is what God has promised. And in Jesus, that is precisely what he has delivered. Let's pray. Gracious Father, how we thank you and praise you that you are not only the ultimate promise maker, but you are the promise keeper, the ultimate promise keeper. Lord, we are so sorry for those times when we don't keep our promises. Lord, we are so sorry for those times in which we think we are worthy of your grace or that we add to it in some way. Lord, please help us, prevent us from looking down on others but so thrilled and delighted in the grace that you have poured out to us through your Son that we might continue to pour out your grace to those around us. Lord, please help us to really be thrilled in the good news of the gift that you've offered through your Son. And Lord, I particularly pray for anyone here today who has not yet accepted that gift. Oh Lord, how I thank you so much that you love them, you love them perfectly, and that you have done everything that they might know you. I pray, would you please move them in the power of your spirit that they might receive that gift, delight in that gift, and share it with the world. Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.